Hello and welcome. My name is Megan Dadios, and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Director of Continuing Education. It's wonderful to have you join us virtually for our second event in our Fall 2022 Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us. As part of our school's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this with on-campus presentations, as well as online courses, webinars, videos, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. We have several online courses beginning tomorrow, including Joy of the Gospel, which provides an opportunity to study Pope Francis's document, The Joy of the Gospel, and reflect on your own faith community as a local presence of gospel joy in the 21st century. Ignatian Spirituality, which explores the pillars of Ignatian Spirituality, including the spiritual exercises, prayer and contemplation, the examine, and discernment. And a new course, Job, Make It Make Sense, which examines methods and opportunities for engaging with scripture in order to unlock some of the Book of Job's secrets. If you're interested in learning more about our online courses or would like to enroll in a course, please visit our website, bc.edu slash crossroads. We'll also include a link to the, in the chat. Our courses are failing fast. Don't miss your chance to register. We have a number of upcoming lectures, and I would like to briefly highlight the next two. On Wednesday, October 19th, STM's own Father John Baldwin will present on Our Reform in Motion, Vatican II and the Liturgy. This lecture is part of the CSJ Institute for Faith Inquiry and Education Symposium series to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council. The lecture will be held at 7.30 p.m. in our Theology and Ministry Library Auditorium with a reception starting at 6.45 p.m. On Thursday, October 27th, Sister Natalie Bequois will present on Becoming a Synodal Church, Issues and Challenges. The lecture will be held in the Heights Room on the Boston College main campus starting at 5.30 p.m. Please join us in person or virtually for either lecture. Our follow-up email will include details on upcoming events and courses. Thanks to our speaker for granting us permission to record today's webinar. As soon as the recording of today's presentation is available for viewing, likely within a month, we will notify all registered participants of the availability of the recording. At the end of the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer. Please feel free to enter a question or comment into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. We will aim to get to as many questions as possible. Finally, we are also able to offer live closed captioning for today's webinar. Please click on the closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen to enable or disable the feature. Many thanks to Ziamara and Tara, graduate students here at the SEM, for providing closed captioning support for us today. I now invite Father Michael McCarthy, SJ, Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Megan, and hello, everyone. And welcome to our presentation, Eco-Womanist Spirituality in a Time of Climate Change. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker. Dr. Melanie L. Harris is Professor of Black Feminist Thought and Womanist Theology, jointly appointed with Wake Forest School of Divinity and the African American Studies Program at Wake Forest University. Dr. Harris is also the director of the Food, Health, and Ecological Well-Being Program. A graduate of the Harvard Leadership Program, Dr. Harris is a former American Council of Education Fellow and founding director of the Texas Christian University African American and Africana Studies Program. Her research and scholarship critically examines intersections between race, religion, gender, and environmental ethics. She is the author of many scholarly articles and books, including Gifts of Virtue, Alice Walker, and Womanist Ethics, Eco-Womanism, Earth Honoring Faiths, and co-editor of Faith, Feminism, and Scholarship, The Next Generation, as well as numerous journal articles and book chapters. Dr. Harris arrived at Wake Forest from Texas Christian University, where she served as Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as a Professor of Religion and Ethics. A former broadcast journalist, Dr. Harris has worked as a news producer for ABC, CBS, and NBC affiliates. A community leader whose passion for education is linked to a commitment for social justice, 
She has also served as an educational consultant with the Ford Foundation, the Forum for Theological Exploration, and the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning in Theology and Religion, Lily Endowment, Inc. She has served on the executive board of the Society for the Study of Black Religion and the board of directors of KERA TV Radio, as well as the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Christian Ethics. Dr. Harris has been the recipient of several prestigious awards and academic fellowships, including the ADRAN Administration Fellowship and Green Faith Fellowship. Dr. Harris earned her PhD and MA degrees from Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, an MDiv from the ILIF School of Theology and a BA from Spelman College. We are delighted to have her join us virtually for this very important and timely presentation. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Thank you so much, Dean McCarthy. Thank you indeed to the entire community at Boston College. It is indeed a gift to be with you in such an important time. I also want to give a special thanks to Megan and Kara and so many who work so hard, James included, to make sure that all the audio and video and Zoom updates were updated today for our webinar. I invite us now to come into a centered place of being as we begin our conversation on eco-womanist spirituality. I will share my screen briefly and invite you indeed to join with me in the conversation. One way to begin is to begin by recognizing that we all have the ability to feel and be centered in joy and also centered in peace. So one of the greatest foundations of eco-womanist spirituality is the breath, remembering indeed that we are all connected and that we all have this way in to centering not just with the divine, but centering indeed with the earth. I invite you to come to a centered place in your own spirit and in your own body and mind by simply breathing in three times very deeply. One way to do this is to ground your feet firmly into the ground wherever you are to remind yourself about a good, healthy alignment in your body and to sit in a relaxed way, hands perhaps on the thighs or on the knees. And just take a moment to center your own awareness. You might close your eyes or leave them open. We'll take three deep breaths together as a learning community. Breathing in very deeply and exhaling as you're ready. Breathing in very deeply and exhaling as you're ready. Breathing in very deeply and exhaling as you're ready. I invite you to simply lean in to the tone of sound as we begin this meditative way of being together. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. to cross over into campground. Ooh, deep river. 
My home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord. I want to cross over. Into camp ground. The sound and tone of African American spirituals can be an access point to begin to recognize the gifts of eco womanist spirituality, a deep reminder that we are indeed in tune and connected spirit to spirit, earth to earth. We begin our journey into eco womanist spirituality with the enjoyment or pleasure of audio, sound, but also the gift of visual art. Here before you, you see a beautiful image a gorgeous portrait by Healing Grace by Charles Bibbs. This image connotes a kind of connection between humans, the divine, and earth. Reflective indeed of African and indigenous cosmologies in which all three realms are leaning in or connected to each other, human, divine, and earth. This image by Charles Bibbs reminds us that that connection, that harmony is indeed sacred. That to do work in environmental justice is also to do spiritual work. The framing intellectually and theoretically of eco-womanism begins with a very simple definition. Eco-womanism is an approach to earth justice or environmental justice that centers the theological voices and ethical perspectives and the multi-layered analysis and experiences of women of color, specifically African-American women. Eco-womanism is indeed a way in that contributes and also highlights the amazing work of environmental justice keepers who come from the African diaspora, often women who recognize the complex relationship between earthkeeping, being a woman, and a caregiver for family and particularly for children, and also the ways that the earth is actually held in some cases positively, but sometimes negatively, using a gendered lens. It is indeed the voices of Wangari Mathai, Alice Walker, Bell Hooks, and many womanist theologians and ethicists that allow us to see the connecting points between an eco-womanist approach and an environmental ethics approach. Eco-womanism is essentially an opportunity or an offering to engage race, class, gender, and multi-layered analysis with the realities of climate change. When we consider the impact that race or environmental racism has on particularly communities of color, how class or economic instability or this uh, disorientation has on climate change when we consider how race, class, and gender dis disproportionately impact communities of color, we have a new frame. Thinking about environmental justice from that frame helps us to lean in to an eco-womanist 
or intersectional way of analyzing environmental ethics. For eco-womanism, there is an important method, a seven-step method that allows anyone to be able to access a kind of eco-womanist approach. Often I am um, presented with the question from students about womanism as a base for eco-womanism. And the question is often from students from a variety of different cultures who are non-Black asking if they can use a womanist methodology or an eco-womanist methodology. For me and for eco-womanism, the answer is yes, in part because the eco-womanist method begins with honoring your own experience, honoring your own eco-memory or your own connection with the earth. Step two is reflecting on that experience recognizing a connection with earth, recognizing the earth indeed as sacred. And then for African and African-Americans, particularly those across the diaspora, to examine more carefully the shared experiences of beauty and suffering that one might actually have historically with the earth. This might show up as parallel oppressions between Black women and the earth. The work of theologian Dolores Williams, a womanist scholar who wrote very specifically about eco-womanist ideas and themes even before the term was made popular. She highlights in an essay, Sin Nature and Black Women, the important comparison between the act of dynamiting the inside of a mountain for coal retrieval and the act of violence towards black women throughout the history of slavery in the United States of America. This repeated violence to the inside womb of mountain and black women is an important example of how the oppressions may follow the same logic, a logic of domination. For Williams and for many womanists, it is important to recognize the similarity of logic of dominations that are used throughout religious thought and also used throughout the world as methods of control. Deepening into the method, then we go to step three of conducting social analysis, really being specific about using race, class, gender analysis or intersexual analysis, asking the questions, for example, when we come to the analysis of a water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi, or the impact of a hurricane in Puerto Rico, to really ask the hard questions about how race and culture matters, how language matters in the quest for environmental justice in these cases, how gender matters, how class matters, and so much more. This kind of womanist social analysis or intersectional analysis helps not only to reveal the actual issues of justice, but also begins to help us to find solutions for environmental justice. The fourth step in eco-womanism is to critically explore tradition, to consider in the case of the spiritual saying as a part of our meditation, deep river, that there are sometimes binaries, hierarchies that float in the hymns that we sing in the tradition. 
for the keeping of earth justice and the true vision of an eco-womanism, there is a kind of wholeness that begins to set us apart, a kind of deep way of moving away from hierarchy, moving away from the logic of domination, a suggestion that we are all one. By critically exploring our traditions, even the lyrics of hymns and songs and spirituals, we begin to scale back some of the hindrances towards moving towards ecological wholeness. Step five is to engage in transformation, to not be afraid of interrogating, changing, and being transformed by new and fresh eco-theologies. Oftentimes, these insights to be able to change and transform theology come by doing step six, sharing dialogue. Here, as you'll see in my book, Eco-Womanism, the work of interfaith and interreligious and intra-religious dialogue is key towards helping us to shape theologies for earth justice that are also keeping with honoring variety of different religious traditions and ideas. Finally, the seventh step of eco-womanism is to take action for justice, to share in the justice work, protesting the logic of domination wherever it finds itself, to protest racial ignorance, and indeed to be anti-racist in protesting systems or realities of white supremacy. As we turn toward looking at the roots of eco-womanist spirituality, it's important to recognize that some of the eco-womanist models are indeed historical models of freedom and connected to a variety of different social justice movements. In the work of Monica White and Chris Carter, we find a deep, deep uncovering of the spirituality of those such as Fannie Lou Hamer, an African-American woman who fought very deeply during the civil rights movement in the 1950s, 1960s, to be able to bring to voice food justice issues as they were compiled by the realities of white supremacy and racism throughout the South. It is the song and music and voice of Fannie Lou Hamer that we see as instrumental for living out a kind of healthy eco-womanist spirituality. I invite you to listen and hear. of Fannie Lou Hamer in this, her favorite song, This Little Light of Mine, certainly came out of her own voice, but was always deeply connected to the voices of others in community. It is the power of that song, the power of singing in community, that emboldened entire communities to stand up to racial oppression in the South during the Civil Rights Movement. 
It is that tapping into the kind of spiritual root or power, not just of song, but of the oneness that the song represents, the igniting of light upon light upon light in each being that eco-womanist spirituality is framed upon in that we highlight the voices of African-American women specifically. It is important to recognize that even as we practice earth justice in this day, it is the work and the root of the scholarly mind of Fannie Lou Hamer and others who works tirelessly to create co-ops, farmers, and to create land opportunities for those who were living in abject poverty throughout the South. Helping people learn how to garden and feed themselves was the way to promoting full and true justice in the work of Fannie Lou Hamer towards the end of her life. The Freedom Farms became one of the most important contributions to environmental justice work in the States in that time. And we see that remnant living out in gardens, urban and rural, throughout many communities in this time. As an ethicist, it is often important to be able to bring forth the ethical model of eco-womanist and in some instances, eco-womanist spirituality. We, when we examine the freedom farms of Fannie Lou Hamer and the communities that she helped to organize around food justice, we find particular values coming out of her work, liberation, resistance, self-reliance, self-determination, food, quality of life, political activism, connection with the earth, community, and solidarity. In a Western context, it is often important to explain something of two of these values, self-reliance and self-determination. In this context, self-reliance does not actually illuminate a kind of focus on the individual, but rather a kind of healing empowerment of each being, regardless of racism, regardless of classism, regardless of sexism, to be able to see themselves as fully connected and fully empowered with the light in everything else to be able to depend on the self and on the community rather than depend on the system of white supremacy is the meaning of the value of Fannie Lou Hamer in self-reliance. Self-determination in this sense is also important in that it is not an individual kind of coming into a consciousness of what the one person can do but rather in an African-American religious thought sense and also coming from a womanist tradition, self-determination means a kind of awareness of the depth of power within oneself to be able to communicate and work alongside the community that all in that community recognize that all these important beings mattered very deeply to the flow and ecology of the planet. In many ways, the work and life of the civil rights movement shows up very powerfully in many of the activists who worked during that time, but continue to write in this day. One of the most empowering voices for womanist thought and eco-womanism is the voice of Alice Walker, the mother of the term womanist, Alice Walker coined the term in the late 1960s and 70s during the height of the women's freedom movement. Coming into conversation with other white feminists, 
she began to recognize the unawareness, the lack of awareness of the importance of racial analysis in many white women's framing of feminism. She also recognized that there was a kind of shunning of masculinity or maleness from many feminist circles. For her as an African-American woman, it was important to always be inclusive of brothers, fathers, sons, even the voice of Stevie Wonder, she writes. For this reason, she came up with a different term, inclusive of radical examination of sexism and patriarchy, but also inclusive of race talk or racial analysis and inclusive of a variety of different expressions of gender, of sexuality, of being. The work of Alice Walker is particularly important for eco-womanism in that we begin to look at the base of the engaging transformation and sharing dialogue. In her book, The Color Purple, she writes that this book was actually my Buddha novel without Buddhism. She writes, in the face of unbearable suffering following the assassinations and betrayals of the civil rights movement, I too sat down upon the earth and asked its permission to posit a different way from that in which I was raised. Just as the Buddha did, when Mara, the king of delusion, asked what gave him the right to think, he could direct humankind away from the suffering they had always endured. When Mara queried him, the Buddha touched the earth. This is the single most important act to my mind of the Buddha because it acknowledges where he came from. It is a humble recognition of his true heritage, his true lineage. Though Buddhist monks would spend millennia pretending all wisdom evolves from the masculine and would consequently treat Buddhist nuns abominably, the Buddha clearly placed himself in the lap of the earth mother and affirmed her wisdom and her support. This insight from Alice Walker opens up the conversation of how important it is to engage in transformation through the act of sharing dialogically across traditions and across different barriers or walls. Here, one who is raised in the Christian tradition, the Methodist tradition, begins at the end of the civil rights movement to be able to engage a different religious tradition, the tradition of Buddhism, in order to gain insight on how to sit with the realities of suffering, of racial injustice, the sight of lynchings, the enduring of racial violence on the body, on the psyche, on the spirit, on the mind. In coming into this kind of fluid spirituality, Alice Walker provides a different opening into an eco-womanist spirituality that affirms Christian tradition in conversation with other religious traditions. Another model of this kind of eco-womanist spirituality that reflects very deeply a connection with the earth is Bell Hooks. In many ways, a recent ancestor. It is her work in thinking about recovering blackness in conversation with the recovery of our connection with the earth and earth justice that begins to unfold a different way in to doing the work of anti-racism. She writes very specifically about the spiritual legacy that comes from peoples of color, particularly African-American peoples who were forced out of the South 
and who very bravely left the work and life of Jim and Jane Crow in order to find new life and freedom elsewhere. The memories, what she terms as eco memory, that were left behind, the knowledge of agricultural brilliance that so many families of African descent spent generations building. Carrying that agricultural memory with them into the North and to particular Northern cities is very difficult. Bell Hooks reminds us that a part of the work of eco-womanist scholarship and spirituality is to uncover the remnants of this kind of agricultural memory, the earth wisdom that so many of our ancestors had even as they left the South to come north to freedom. She writes, to return to eco-memory, for many years and even now, generations of black folks who migrated north to escape life in the South returned down home in search of a spiritual nourishment, a healing that was fundamentally connected to reaffirming one's connection to nature, to a contemplative life where one could take time, sit on the porch, walk, fish, and catch lightning bugs. If we think of urban life as a location where Black folks learned to accept a mind-body split that made it possible to abuse the body, we can better understand the growth of nihilism and despair in the Black psyche. And we can know that when we talk about healing, that psyche must also speak about restoring our connection to the natural world. This framing of an invitation from Bell Hooks to examine our own eco-memory for solutions is that also an important aspect of eco-womanist spirituality. It suggests that by taking a step of truly honoring our experience, our connection with the earth, we may in fact uncover a different way of being, a more contemplative path a path and a spirituality that lends itself more readily to peace, more readily to justice, and more readily to service. By coming home in the ways and the articulation of bell hooks, we acknowledge that we are earth beings, acknowledging eco-memory, recognizing loss, returning to earth communion through contemplative practice, cultivating compassion and a spiritual kinship with the earth, reverencing life and cherishing black life, honoring all beings, work to end white supremacy, walk in dignity, become a witness to earth's beauty and garden, get green, recommit ourselves to earth justice, and for many of us to recreate safe refuge, to recreate home.
Thank you. I welcome your questions and the opportunity to share in dialogue with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. I know I echo uh, from our audience uh, our appreciation for your presentation today. Um, I actually have a question while we give our audience time to enter questions in the Q&A. I was wondering in your work, in your research, um, if you found connections uh, to the Muharista theology. Um, that was just something that I was curious about as I listened. Certainly. Thank you so much for the question. It is indeed a reality of my own training that I was trained by many Mujerisa theologians at Union Theological Seminary. And it is the case that most of womanist and Mujerista theologies actually came into voice together at similar times, and not just at Union, but across the world of liberation theologies um, around the same time. So yes reflected in a lot of womanist thought. We also hear the voices of many Latina and Latino communities, particularly in terms of environmental justice. We know that for many communities across the Latinx diaspora, um, the same struggle around environmental justice also exists for African or Black communities. And so, yes, these theologies, but also the solutions that emerge from them um, are often found in sync. I'll also say to that, that the work of Ivan Gabara and the work of um, ecofeminism, particularly from a Latina feminist perspective, are also an important uh, collaborator in the work of ecowomanism and have been uh, for several generations. Uh, the kind of ways in which Ara Maria's Sassidias opened up conversation between Black liberation theology, womanist thought, and mujer, mujerista theology becomes central to how we do liberation work today. Thank you so much. Um, first question from our audience. Uh, what role does our relationship with the foods we eat play in our reconnecting with the earth? Great question. Thank you so much for that. It is a gift, I think, in many contemplative practices, certainly Christian, Buddhist, but also others, to be able to reflect more deeply about what we put inside of our bodies, food being one. And so there is a way then which eco-womanist spirituality opens up an invitation to be more deeply connected with the food that we actually consume or eat. Some of this can actually take place in an educational context, such as teaching children that their food does not come from the grocery store, um, but that their food actually does come from different farms and different soils and certainly seed. This for many children, even in our day, is pretty radical. So taking time to recognize that food does not come from the grocery store and teaching that is one way to approach the conversation. There's also indeed a deep, deep way of thinking about how we consume meat, for example, and the kind of fossil footprint that meat eating generally leaves on the planet. There are ways in which we might also think about food justice as an access issue. So recognizing that in many of, many of our communities are connected to or in the middle of what we call food deserts whereby there are, is, there are no grocery stores uh, within 50 to 30 miles of that particular neighborhood or space. Oftentimes these food deserts are found in lower income neighborhoods where there is an assumption oftentimes by leaders um, in the community or beyond the community that these people for one reason or another, race is certainly one, um, do not deserve or do not have the, the financial means to afford a grocery store. This kind of dehumanization we find throughout our system politically, but also a deep, deep remnant of white supremacy. So as to act in resistance, actually taking account of the food that we eat ourselves, but also providing opportunities weekly, even daily, to think about accessibility of food in our neighborhoods and beyond is an important way of actually practicing this kind of eco-womanist spirituality. Our next um, 
post is a, is a comment rather than a question, but it kind of speaks to our, our first topic of conversation. Um, the participant thanks you for your presentation and writes, this approach could also be shared to indigenous women across the globe who experience the same domination from all kinds of oppression. It's very good. Yes, I agree. And I concur very deeply. Eco-womanism in part because of the kind of synergies and just the realities of bloodlines in many women of African descent, there is also the blood of indigenous women and indigenous lives. And so eco-womanism is often in concert or in conversation with Native American women, for example, but also a number of different indigenous religious traditions across the world. Uh, much of the work that I've done so far in eco-womanist spirituality is deeply reflective of the kind of interfaith spirituality and knowing that's possible through the lives of women of, of a variety of different indigenous traditions. That is to say that in doing the work of justice, environmental justice, justice for women against violence, uh, these kinds of modes actually present women of indigeneity, but also women of many mainstream kind of religious traditions to come to the question of how do we create justice for all in light of the kind of spiritualities or indigenous religious traditions that we, that we actually practice. So that singing and humming and preparing food and being mindful of how to help women escape domestic violence, for example, uh, to help women name the kind of abusive traps that may be set for the, by for them um, in the midst of a kind of patriarchal systems. These, this too is spiritual work um, and it's engaged by a number of different women across religious traditions. Thank you. Another question, what are some ways that the methodological steps of eco-womanism, which you went through in your lecture, can be applied systemically to address ecological justice? Very good question, thank you. So the, there are many ways in which the, uh, the method for eco-womanism works. And it's important to note that the method of eco-womanism is more uh, better, best understood as a spiral and not necessarily a linear method. And so there are a lot of ways to be able to get in to the conversation. Uh, when we think about a kind of um, systemic approach, we might actually consider that in fact, honoring experience is a way to begin the conversation around anti-racism. So actually naming very early that even the gathering of environmental ethicists to do the work of gardening or to organize a protest um, or to you know, collectively uh, bring awareness around climate change, even that gathering of beings introduces one to the understanding that each of those beings called to environmental justice work probably has and is bringing a different history. It is the case, at least for African Americans and for many peoples of African descent in the United States of America, we are bringing a different kind of history to the environmental justice movement. It is a history that, in the words of Kimberly E. Ruffin, uh, e. Ruffin suggests that there is both beauty and burden, a kind of paradox that she writes about when we recognize that there is indeed beauty that in that African-Americans historically have had an, a particular connection with the earth, in part because moving through the realities of slavery, we are bonded to the earth. But there is also a reality of the lynching tree and the violence and the logic of domination of the earth. Experienced not just by the tree, but also experienced by black communities and black bodies. Acknowledging that environmental activists come into the work with different histories is the first step towards actually engaging systemically recognizing that institutional racism and the history of racism actually has to be uh, dealt with as we engage the work of environmental justice. So even in that first step of honoring experience and even doing that um, introduces another way into the work of anti-racism and really recognizing the limits um, that white supremacist kind of frames present to even the best ecological justice commitments. Another question. What is eco-womanism's view on mineral energy sources such as coal and oil? 
Thank you. It's a great question. There is not just one eco-womanist approach, so I'll say that first. Uh, just like women is thought, there are a variety of different perspectives. I, I am very deeply honored to be speaking with you, but I'm not the only eco-womanist on the planet, <laughs> so I can't speak for the entire tradition. Um, in my own practice and my own understanding of eco-womanism, there is a deep connection and a deep invitation to be highly critical of the kind of uh, addiction that the particularly American society has to fossil fuels. Uh, the majority of my career as a scholar was spent in Texas. And in Texas, there's a particular kind of connection and a valuing of humanity that is connected to fossil fuels in part because of the really significant truck culture there. There is also the reality of landscape. Um, and so depending on one's own uh, profession and one's own life and being, one's own geographical location, one may actually have um, a different way of seeing the impact of fossil fuels. I think in part as the example that I lifted in the lecture also suggested from the work of Dolores Williams, I myself have a particular um, commitment to engaging and, and critiquing the use of minerals, the use of coal particularly, in part because of the logic of domination that is present in the retrieval of coal and the logic of domination that has literally been used against the bodies of black women, the bodies of enslaved black women. And so there is a particular kind of eco-womanist sensibility that I have around fossil fuels in part because of the, the, the lens that I bring as a black woman. Is taking place as we celebrate St. Francis of Assisi today. Um, and as you interweaved into your intellection, there's a spirituality element. And so one of our questions is um, connecting the beauty of the environment, you know, water, birds to spirituality. If you could just speak on that. Sure. So I am one who is framed very deeply by Ignatius spirituality myself and very, very deeply connected to um, saints such as Francis of Assisi in, in part because of the kind of ecological vision and open door that, that um, his life and work certainly offers to many of us who work in ecological justice, particularly from a Christian perspective. I think that there's, there's lots of invitation here to be able to kind of sit with the message and the being and the spirit of a Francis Assisi or uh, Thomas Merton or um, many of the kind of women saints, not just in Christianity, but also many Buddhist nuns. There is a deep way of being with the earth and with the planet, particularly with animals that deserves more attention. One, if one has a pet or one is familiar with the kind of affection that can be developed with an animal, one recognizes that there is a kind of sacred connection that one can have, that there is a kind of communication and communication pattern that one can have with a being that is non-human. This, I think, is what Francis Assisi and so many were trying to communicate, that there is a kind of oneness, a kind of communication, a kind of connection that human beings can have with other beings. In the work of Howard Thurman, a Christian mystic in the Protestant tradition, he talks and writes very openly about his affection for a particular tree that he was very close to as a child growing up. He writes about how he watched his ancestors and has watched himself sing to roses in order to help them to bloom. This kind of interbeing in the work, uh, in the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, is actually central for us to be able to recognize that the human, the anthro anthropological perspective, the human is not the only center from which to make a, a, a claim on what environmental justice can look like. That in fact, it is important to listen to the voice of water, the voice of earth, the voice of energy, the voice of all beings, that this is a way into actually receiving and living into justice. 
that's a perfect place for us to stop. And thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Harris. We really enjoy your presentation. We have a lot to, to think about and to put into practice in our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boston College. And thank you all for joining us, our audience members. We look forward to you joining us at our next event. Have a great rest of your day.